So uh, I'm kind of disappointed. I bought, how many of you, and I am going to get into the message today, but um, I, had a, I had a Bible, and I just replaced it recently. It was falling apart. It had post-it notes all through it. But most of all, it was too small for me to read. You got me? So I bought one of these Bibles that is the large print. And I still can't read it. (laughs) So I'm going to go back and forth. You're going to see me because I want to see you. And I want to see what the Lord is doing. Uh, We're going to talk about Deborah and Barak. If you have been here for any any length of time, I know that you have also heard about Ahab and Jezebel, and that there isn't, my friend Aaron has done an incredible job of laying the foundation of how Jezebel and Ahab really wreaked havoc with God's chosen ones. And he even wreaked havoc, they wreaked havoc with the prophets of that time. The interesting thing is that as I was waking up this morning praying, the Lord told me that the story of Deborah and Barak, and we can throw Jael in there too, is the antithesis, it's the antithesis of what we hear from Jezebel and Ahab. That, that not one is going out, but we see this beautiful partnership between Deborah and Barak. Most of all, what we see is Deborah and Barak are willing to listen. They're not without fear because, you know, they, Barak, if we, as we go to, through the story, you'll see he has fear and he is not really wanting to do what the Lord has already told him. But we see that as somebody comes alongside of him and reminds him, hey, God is with you, that Barak steps in and he fully steps in. This morning, I want to share a story that isn't, it's about me, but it's not pleasant to share. Uh, Those ones are really fun to share. I would love to share stories about you that aren't pleasant, (laughs) but I don't know any, so we're going to go with me. But before we do, let me just pray for us. God, we thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for how we can look in your word for your character for the way that you move on behalf of your children. Thank you for how you remind us of how good you are. Father, we just pray that you would move in this place right now. Lord, I pray for hope to be restored. I pray for joy to be restored. Father, I pray for those dreams and those words that you have spoken over us that we have put to the wayside, that we have forgotten about that we have thought, I can't step into that. Father, I pray that you would breathe your breath on those places even today. With your eyes closed, the Lord actually showed me last night in a dream um, of someone who was uh, in a wheelchair, and it was as if spiritually, I want to talk about this, that it was as if spiritually they were in a wheelchair and they couldn't actually move forward. And I just want you to be brave even right now because I, I feel like the Lord wants to begin with this, not end with this. But if you feel like you have been in a place where you have been stuck and you have not been able to move forward, it's been so debilitating that you feel like honestly, you've been stuck in a wheelchair and other people have to push you forward, but you cannot push yourself forward. I just want you to stand right now because I actually want to pray for you right at the beginning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. There's also another group that I want you to stand. We're going to hear about how there was unsettledness for 20 years in this story. And I feel like the Lord wants to restore hope that there are some of you who have prodigals. There are prodigals in your life. There are spouses, there are children, there are family members who for over 20 years, they have been not walking with the Lord. So Father, I thank you for these ones right now in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name, I take authority over every block, every wall that has come up against them, against their loved ones, And in the authority of Jesus, 
I call for every wall, every block, every hindrance to be broken down in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you that you are the restorer of hope, that you breathe life on dry, dead bones. And so, Lord, I pray right now that you would be breathing on these ones, on their spirit. Lord, I thank you that no prayers are ever lost. So, Lord, we give these to you in Jesus' name, and we say, have your way. Thank you. Thank you for being brave and standing up. Father is good. He is good. About 10 years ago, I was at a Taco Bell. Don't judge. And I know some of you are still judging. I was at a Taco Bell with my kids, and they were little, and we went into Taco Bell to get food for them, not me, because I don't eat that stuff. And we walked in, I only feed it to my children. <laughs> we walked in and there was a man standing behind and he was a worker. And the Lord began to download to me about that worker, some words that he wanted to release over his life. And I had been asking the Lord, Lord, if you just give me words from you, prophetic inclinations, I will be bold and I will release it wherever I go. And in that moment, I was like, I'm not actually going to do that because this is really awkward. This is a restaurant and we're here for food. We're not here for that and so I took my kids, we got our food, the nagging was still there, like the Lord is like, you, I'm giving you this, what are you going to do with it? And so we went outside, I was like, oh, whew. okay, we went outside, got to my car, and I saw that worker, because no longer was he in the Taco Bell, but now he was taking a break, and he was outside, And I thought, well, that would be ridiculous for me to go now because I have all of my children with me and that doesn't seem safe. Do I leave them in the car? Do I take them with me? Now we're not in a safe environment. We're not inside Taco Bell. We're outside of Taco Bell. And so I, much to disappoint you, I did not go. I didn't go and I didn't say what the Lord had given me. I didn't release what the Lord had given me. That night at about 2 a.m., as the Lord would have it, he woke me up and he began to very sweetly, as a sweet father, not as a punishing father, but as a sweet father, he began to tell me, you have asked to hear my voice. And if you ask to hear my voice, and I tell you about things about another person, is it for you or is it for them? And Casey remembers my, my husband sitting right here, handsome guy right there, right beyond Amy and Sean, that it was devastating to my heart. I was like, oh my goodness, Lord, I did not realize that when you reveal things to me like that, you are asking me to respond. You are asking for obedience. This is the life of Deborah. Last week, Sean laid the groundwork for judges, and he talked about this very sad pattern that probably is unfortunately familiar to us about Israel's desire for the Lord. Lord, we will do whatever you tell us to do. We are yours. We're completely yours. Just tell us. Tell us what to do. We'll go. We'll do. We'll say. We won't build any other gods before you because we are so in love with you. And then, given enough time, they build up gods. They build up things that they pull into this relationship that, that can't have anything except for the Lord. It causes them to be disobedient. And then it causes the Lord to step back. We are living in a different covenant, but sometimes it's us that steps away from the Lord, you know? So here is what we have. We have, the Lord is asking us, will we listen no matter the cost? Will we obey? In Judges chapter 4, 
Let's go ahead and dive into this. I have a lot that I want to read and a very little bit amount of time. And right now, I can't actually see the text at all. <laughs> what I want you to know is Israel was in a place for 20 years. In Judges chapter 4, 20 years they had been oppressed. I don't know about you, but... There are times when I look at what is happening just in our nation and in our state. I'm like, oh my goodness, Lord, I feel so oppressed. That was what was going on. And, and we see that even in later in Judges chapter 5, Deborah sings a song, basically a song about what has happened. And she reveals to us that through that season, the, the streets were deserted that no one was willing to walk because their oppression was so great that they had felt like they had to hide who they were, what they were about. Now that I have my glasses and those of you who need them too, we can start. I do want to share though what I love about judges and the prophets and also kings in, in the Old Testament. If we understand the Bible as a whole, start to finish. We understand that all of these actually point towards Jesus. And we must know that as we look at these, because even in Judges, there were some judges that had significant flaws. There were kings that had significant flaws. There were prophets that had significant flaws. The beauty in all of that is it points us towards Jesus. And even in the Old Testament, we can see that there is this anticipation that something better has to come than what they have right now. There has to be a better judge. There has to be a better king. There has to be a better prophet. And all of that is pointing towards Jesus. Their hearts are longing for him. And that's where we are. We are in this place where... Jesus himself, when he came, he said words like, I am the one true judge, and I don't judge on my own accord, but I judge according to my Father. That he is the one that in Revelation, he also said, I am the Lord of Lords, I am the King of Kings. That as we go through Deborah and the life of Deborah, we're going to pull out the things that are good because Deborah is a good judge. But ultimately, we have to remember Jesus. He is our one true judge. He is the one who we live our life about. He is the one who we focus on. So there's going to be things about Deborah that we are going to fall in love with. There are going to be things about JL that probably we don't fall in love with, and it scares us a little bit. And Barak, there are going to be things that we read about that we are like, wow, I get that. You know, when I first learned about Barak, it was like, come on, buddy. <laughs> Step up to the plate. But then when I actually take a look at my own life, I can go, wow. Yeah, I, it only took Taco Bell for me to cave. I mean, <laughs> that, <laughs> go Barak. I get it. Okay, so in Judges 4, verse 1, it says, and I'm just going to be jumping through. I have a lot of it highlighted, but I'm going to be jumping through the text this morning. It says, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who dealt in the Herosh something else. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, for Jabin had 900 chariots of iron, and 20 years he had harshly oppressed the children of Israel. That's a long time for them to be oppressed. It's an even longer time for them to wait and call upon the Lord. Really? that our hearts would be quick to turn towards the Lord. And if our hearts aren't quick to turn towards the Lord, that we would be asking, what about my heavenly father do I not view correctly? Because he is a loving father. That's who he is. Jesus is our friend. He's not a deserter. 
So moving on, it gets better. This is right where it turns for us. Chapter 4, verse 4. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. And she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel and the mountains of Ephraim. I love that because Deborah had her own tree. Praise the Lord. I want to find the tree of Kathy, but I haven't found it yet. What I love about this is she was between Ramah and Bethel. Bethel, if you have any idea what that means, it means the house of God. So here she has placed herself literally and metaphorically in such a beautiful place with the Lord. And it says that the children of Israel came to her for judgment. I want us to catch that because Deborah was not someone who went over and said, I need to give you your judgment. You two right here, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> not them. I love them. <laughs> she knew this is where the Lord has placed me. I don't know about you. I have three kids. They're all here with us today. But Mama Bear gets riled up when somebody else comes in and they try to step in and correct my own children when I know I have the love for them and I can actually see and focus on them. I can actually bring correction knowing what their future is, knowing what the Lord has in store for them. Here is what we see. Deborah, she actually is in a place where Israel came to her for judgment. They are the ones who came to her. People come to me and they ask me advice. Honestly, I don't really go out to people and say, I think you need my advice. I think I have something good for you. Deborah, she was the one who God placed. People came to her because they knew she was a beacon of wisdom. What I also love about Deborah is it, she was known that she would actually speak the voice of her father. She didn't speak the voice of the oppressors. And we can do that. We can get into this place where, oh my goodness, what is around me and, and what I've seen and the way that the world is going, that is what is influencing me. And so that is what I'm speaking. I'm speaking that, yeah, I don't think there's any hope. There's certainly not hope for me. There's not hope for you. There's not hope for your children. There's not hope for my children. That we can get caught up in this hearing other voices other than the voice of our father. Deborah placed herself where she was actually listening to the voice of her father. She devoted herself to what the Lord actually wanted to say rather than any other voice. We need to find ourselves there. Some of us want to be this voice for this season and for the time. And I'm telling you, that is what the Lord is calling us to right now. He is saying, will you be the voice for the people around you? Will you be the voice for your family? Will you be the voice for your marriage? Will you be the voice for your children and your community? But so often we slip into letting other voices speak to us. And then that's what we regurgitate. Deborah, she had the voice of our father. And the voice of our father was what she actually regurgitated. It is what she spoke. I still want my own tree. I love this part in verse 6. It says, Then she sent and called for Barak. And she says to him, has not the Lord God of Israel commanded you go and deploy the troops at Mount Tabor? Take with you 10,000 men of the sons of Naphtali and the sons of Zebulun. And against you, I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army with his chariots and his multitude at the river Kishon. And I will deliver him into your hand Deborah is giving Barak this lowdown. <laughs> She's saying, I know what's on your life. I know what the Lord has put on your life. Has he not commanded you to go? 
And I wonder for us, how many of us, are we sitting in this calling? Are we sitting in this place? And the Lord is saying, haven't I commanded you to go? Haven't I commanded you to do something for my kingdom? You're not doing it alone. That's what, that's what Deborah was reminding Barak. Barak had somehow gotten himself to the place where he was like, I've seen how strong they are. I've seen the oppression. I've felt the oppression. But the Lord gave him a word. And we know those kinds of words of the Lord do not return void. So here we have Barak being reminded, go. I've sent you. I've put something on your life. And I need you to step into it. In this moment, we see that Deborah comes alongside of him. And Barak's response next is, I ain't going unless you're going with me. I would have been fine as long as it wasn't at Taco Bell. <laughs> but seriously, Deborah is like, yes, because I've also heard the word of the Lord over your life, Barak. Let's do it. She does tell him that the victory won't be his, but the victory will be the Lord's. How beautiful. What a beautiful thing because Barak still goes. Barak is devoted to the Lord and he wants to accomplish the Lord's purposes. But even in that moment, he is saying, yeah, I don't need this victory to be mine. I'm fine with it being the Lord's. There are victories that the Lord has out for each one of you. He has them ahead of you already. And he is asking you to step in, to fully step in. And some of you, some of the missing piece is that you want to do it on your own and you aren't willing to have the Debras and the JLs come alongside of you so that the victory isn't yours and the victory isn't mine and the victory isn't Sean's or Amy's, but the victory is the Lord's. The Lord is in a season right now where he wants his name on his victory. He doesn't want his name on your victory. He doesn't want his name on my victory. He wants his name on his victory. Because what happens is when people see that, they turn towards the Lord and they raise their hands to him rather than raise their hands to me. I can't even handle that. I have enough troubles that I've told you about already. This is such a beautiful picture. As we go down further, this is wild. In verse 11, it says, now Herber, don't add a T to his name, it's not Herbert, as Herber, the Kenite, of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, there's a lot of groundwork right there for who this person is, and that's significant. This was an important person. But I want you to see what happened. Had separated himself from the Kenites and had pitched a tent near the Terebinth tree, which is beside Kadesh. And in verse 12, it says, And they reported to Sesera that Barak had gone up to, the Mount, to Mount Tabor. Here, here's what I find fascinating in that verse. Barak got a word from the Lord. He ignored it. Deborah then got that same word. She reminded him of the word. Barak began to move in that word. He began to step forward. But there were a couple of people who separated. They departed. And these are well-known people. They departed from those two to wait for Sesera, to wait so that they could say, this is what Barak is up to. Barak is actually going to come and he is going to annihilate you. I want you to know that both in the physical and in the spiritual, when you step out, there are people 
both in the demonic realm, but also in the natural realm. There are people who will say, I am going to step away from what the Lord is doing with them, and I am going to go relay to the enemy. They are about to move. They are about to move, and they are about to advance the kingdom. But what happened? Did Barack step back and go, whoa, let's take a second look at this. No, he didn't. He continued. We see, then Deborah said to Barak, up, for this is the day which the Lord has delivered Sesera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone before you? And in verse 15, it says, the Lord routed Sesera and all his chariots and his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sesera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. That is in the New King James Version. Just so you know, if he alighted himself on foot, it means he ran. <laughs> but I love this because in this moment, Deborah is saying, come on, come on. Now's the time. Now's the time. Stand up. Let's go. The Lord is ahead of you. He's on the move. And for many of us, we have to be reminded, like even now the Lord is saying, come on, come on. Step up, step into what I have on your life. It's time, it's time on the earth, it's time in you. It's time for this church. Amen to that. We go down a little further, and I don't want to spend much time on JL, mostly because it's gory and it's really quite graphic, but... Sesera, that commander who, with all of his chariots and all of his army men dead, Sesera flees. He alighted on his foot and he ran and he hid in Jael's tent. And Jael, interestingly enough, I, this is only the Lord that instead he asks her for water and she gives him milk. And if you know anything about milk, and the fat content in milk, it put him to sleep like Thanksgiving Day and a turkey. <laughs> she knew, I'm not going to give him water. I'm going to give him milk. And then she drove a stake in his head and killed him. <laughs> Crazy. And awesome. All at the same time. That's right. <laughs> What I love about this, though, is we see these three. These three are moving in tandem. What I love about that is the body of Christ is three in tandem. Here we are. We don't sufficiently walk out God's calling without God the Father, without Jesus the Son, and without Holy Spirit. The Lord moves us in three. If we want to remove the Holy Spirit, we're not going to hear the whispers. We're not going to hear what the Lord wants to do in a moment. We're not going to hear the those things, those promptings. We aren't going to receive the visions, the dreams that he wants to give us in order to know what is on his heart. Here, these three, they're moving in tandem to advance the Father's purposes. For us, we are in a season where the Lord does not want to advance his purposes in one person, but he wants to advance it in a family. It is all over Judges chapter 4. This is a family on move to take down the schemes of the enemy. We are in a season where the Lord wants us to move as a family. The Rock of Roseville, he wants you to move as a family to advance the Father's purposes here in this region. In chapter 5, I love this because they begin to sing a song, Deborah and Barak. I'm just going to read a little bit of it, especially now since I know how many of you are going to read Judges chapter 4 and 5 this week. Okay, those of you who didn't raise your hand, I would like to see you after the service. Right up here. 
But I know that you are going to read this, and even if you didn't raise your hand, I know that the Lord is going to wake you up and prompt in you to read it. When the leaders lead in Israel, when the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. Don't you love that? Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. Even I, I will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. And then it continues, Lord, when you went out, when you marched from the field, the earth trembled and the heavens poured out. The clouds also poured water. The mountains gushed before the Lord. This Sinai before the Lord God of Israel. Jumping down to verse 6. The highways were deserted. This is what I told you. The travelers walked along the byways. Village life ceased. It ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose. Arose a mother of Israel. And then in verse 12 it says, Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake, sing a song. Arise, Barak, and lead your captives away. And then in verse, at the very, very end, it says, Thus let all your enemies perish, O Lord, but let those who love him be like the sun when it comes out in full strength. In California, we understand what that means. (laughs) And those of you who went to Cancun, you understand it even more. The very last, this is my kind of book. Casey and I, we will get books and we will read to about the 13th chapter. If there's 13 chapters, is it chapter seven? Six? Chapter six, we're done. It was like, okay, this has taken too long. We, uh, either we're going to skip to the end or we're done with the book. Here, the ending chapter, the ending line So the land had rest for 40 years. I love that because at the beginning of this, for 20 years, they were oppressed. And they sat in oppression, heavy oppression. But the end of the story, because those three, Barak, Deborah, and Jael, were willing to obey. They were willing to step out. Barak was willing to step out even in his fear. Because of that, the land rested for 40 years. Here's the beautiful thing about about that little phrase and everything that's packed in that phrase. The land rested for 40 years. It doesn't just mean that the people and the families and the village life, like they all were excited and now they were back on the streets, but it actually means the land, the physical land changed because of the obedience of these. The land changed. The same land that groans. In the New Testament, it says it groans. The land groans for sons and daughters to rise up. The land itself is groaning for us to step into our inheritance, to step in as sons and daughters. And here we see that the land rested for 40 years. It's like the land, if it could talk, was saying, thank you for finally letting rest come. Thank you for letting us do what we were intended to do. Thank you for letting what the creator put in us to be able to come forth. The land was saying that. It wasn't just the people. And don't get too weird. The land actually doesn't speak in that way. But we just see that it wasn't one little aspect that rested. But it was every aspect that rested. And I know that for you, if you're like me, there are places in my life that I just feel like, man, that is, n- that is not at rest. That place right there, these places are at rest, but that one thing, that is not at rest. And because these three decided to listen to the voice of our Father, all of those places rested. 
I believe that the worship team is coming up. If they're not, I'm going to invite them now. You know, I was sharing with the team even before we came down here that I was here about a year ago and the Lord gave me this prophetic word. He said, the Rock of Roseville is a people of tenacity. And I thought, wow, that's an amazing word. What in the world do you mean by that? And I knew what tenacity means. Tenacity just means this strength. But what tenacity, he said, you need to break that down. Tena city. And what tena city means, it's a city of people who have strength, who are moved by strength. This week, as I was asking him about the Rock of Roseville, he said to me, I kept hearing they're hard pressed. But as they're hard pressed on each side, what is coming out of them is the light of me that I am shining forth like the dawn through them. That is my intention. I want you to go ahead and stand right now. We only have a couple minutes left. I believe nobody gave me a time frame. So we could keep going on and on and on, but I want to land this. The Lord wants you to step into all he has intended. I almost wrote an Instagram post this morning because it was really on my heart. And then I didn't. And I, I will save it for another day. There is something that, that I see that is disturbing to me. Because I know what it does if you hear it long enough or if you see it long enough. And what I have seen is very well-meaning, very well-known people who are right now telling the body of Christ, maybe you're not ready to step in. Maybe you haven't received everything that you need to receive. You need to learn more. You need to grow more. Just sit on the, on the side. Just sit in the back row until we tell you that you're ready. Maybe you're not ready to step out when you're at Walmart or Starbucks or Taco Bell. I want to tell you that the Lord needs you. He needs each one of you. He needs you to step in. He needs you to be healthy. He needs you to be emotionally and spiritually in line with him. He needs you to receive from him everything that you can receive so that then you will move forward. We can't bypass that process of receiving all of the love that he has for us. But once we've received all of the love and once we know that he's done, we have to step in. This season right now, I want you to know that you were born for this season. You could have been born in the 1800s. He could have waited to put you on the planet. But our God, who sees everything and knows everything, he actually birthed you on purpose to fulfill his purposes in you, on the planet, in this season. If you are 50 like me, he birthed you to be 50 right now on the earth in this season to accomplish his purposes that need to happen now. If you are 70, he did the same thing. Everything that he did in your life, he did so that at the age of 70, you would step in. If you're 18, if you're 21, if you're 28, if you're 35, I don't want you to doubt that the Lord himself has not put you on this earth at this time to accomplish his purposes. We are in a dire state with the kingdom of God. The Lord is looking Second Chronicles 16.9 says that he looks to and fro to see whose heart is his 
The Lord wants to accomplish his purposes in you more than you want to accomplish his purposes in you. That's how strong he wants to accomplish his purposes. I want you to go ahead and bow your head, and I want to invite our team up. And the Rock of Roseville prayer team, if you feel led, I want you to come up. But if you need to receive today, I want you to receive today. Father God, I thank you for the Deborah, and I thank you for the Barack, and I thank you for the JL, that each one of them moved in different ways, but they accomplished your purposes that you had set out for them to accomplish. Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you would be moving in this room and that you would be encountering us, reminding us of what you've put inside of us, that you would stir up once again that fire, that you would breathe on us that fire of your spirit. I remember hearing the baptism of repentance and the baptism of water is for us. It cleanses us. But the baptism of fire of the Holy Spirit is for them. So Jesus, I pray that you would move right now in this place. That you would begin to stir up your calling, your purpose. That you would be reminding us of who we are in you. Jesus, we give you position and place this morning that you would take your place right here, front and center. Pray for those face-to-face -face encounters, speaking once again what you have birthed in us. So Holy Spirit, we invite you to move. As the Father is stirring in you, I want to invite you to come up. We want to pray with you. We want to partner with everything that the Lord wants to accomplish in you. And if you need to go get your kids, I want to welcome you to go get your kids. And if you want to bring them back, please do. Father God, I thank you. There, the Lord was showing me two things. He was showing me um, people who struggle with heartburn regularly last night and also people who it feels like you have a weight on your shoulders and it isn't pleasant. If that do, can you raise your hand? Okay. Can you come up here and receive prayer? Father God, I thank you for these ones. Just come up to anyone. Lord, I thank you for these ones. And I just pray for that heartburn to be lifted off of them in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you. And I pray for that weightiness that is on them to be lifted off in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And the rest of you, I just want you to hold your hands out. And I want you to say, Jesus, all that you have for me, all that you've called me to do, remind me of your purposes in me, in Jesus' name. This day, I choose you, Father. I choose you, Jesus. I choose you, Holy Spirit. Have your way in me. Amen.